So security has a lot of uh, fundamental contradictions in it. One is uh, usability, security, choose one. Another is um, the view that security can't be measured. Uh, the next speaker is going to try to uh, glue these two ideas together. Uh, Luo Bauer, who comes from another good CS department in the United States whose name starts with a C. <laughs> Which is Carnegie Mellon and not, not, not Cornell. Thank, thanks, Fred. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, Andre and I both went in sort of very different directions from where we could have gone when choosing the topic for, 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 uh, for our talks. Unfortunately, we didn't go in the very different same direction. I'm going to be talking. I'm, t I'm going, to, going to be talking about passwords. Uh, this is work that I've been doing with a whole bunch of people over, uh, and I think we're now in, in our seventh year. When we started, I thought this was going to be something we'll do uh, for for six months, maybe, and then we'll be done, and it'll be kind of a cute little thing. And it, and it turns out we're, we're still doing it, and uh, you can judge whether it's a, it's a waste of time or, or there's something interesting there. Um, I do want to say, to give you some context for where I'm coming from, that I do do various things in computer security, some of which are more theoretical, some of which involve systems building, and some, some of only some of which are, are uh, in the usability space. Uh, so for example, I've worked on logic-based uh, access control for, for quite a while. I've uh, done some modeling of runtime monitors, uh, and there's some proving theorems involved there, unlike in, in the current work. Uh, I've done some work on, on information flow control, again, then nice theorems there. Uh, and, and then there's this work on passwords that, uh, that, that I'll be talking about today. So um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about um, a, 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 a setting that's very different than, than, um, uh, than what we usually think about when we, when we think about verification, but I'm going to use some of the terminology of verification and maybe bring some of the at least high-level methodology of what we might do in verification to, to, uh, to this setting. So, when we talk about verification, we might uh, talk about verifying, uh, verifying software or applications. Uh, we, might, we might apply techniques, verification techniques to, to operating systems or perhaps to hardware or perhaps to the combination of all of these. Uh, and, and in this talk, I'm going to be talking about situations where the, uh, we also include the user. When we, when we talk about the system, we actually don't talk about just the hardware and the software. We talk about uh, really the, the user who is operating system, the system. And particularly, I'm interested in situations where the behavior of the system is to a very large extent determined by what the user is doing, such that actually the, the, the major component that's, uh, 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 that's responsible for what the system is, how the system is going to behave is, is the user and not, uh, not necessarily the, the hardware or the software. Um, of course, we're still going to worry about uh, attackers of, of, of various sorts. So I'm going to try to um, describe work that, that, uh, that one can do in this space that we've done in, 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 a, particular, uh, for a, particular, in a particular example of a situation like this uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of steps that you might use when verifying, uh, verifying a piece of software. Namely, there's one phase of the work or one step that involves modifying, uh, modeling the system, right? except now the system we're modeling is not just, uh, not just the software or not just the hardware, it's also, it also includes the user. And then there's a, there's a step which involves modeling the attacker. This one is kind of interesting uh, when, when we talk about humans because one kind of an attacker is an external attacker which we deal with uh, normally in verification as well. But another kind of attacker that we need to worry about is the user himself or herself. Such in, in the sense that the user himself or herself might uh, use the system, might behave in a way that causes, uh, causes them harm, independently of the fact that there may, may not be any, any actual attacker outside of the system. Um, and then after we, have, after we have a model of a system and a model of attacker, then we can think about whether a system meets some, we can, we can think about defining some security properties and, and checking whether, whether the system uh, meets them. So what I hope you will, you will take away from this talk is that uh, in many ways, and maybe some of these things you'll already believe, in many ways doing some sort of verification uh, when you're reasoning about these systems whose behavior is largely determined by humans is, uh, is, is much harder and less well-defined than, than when we're doing verification of, of uh, well-specified software and hardware. Uh, yet for, for uh, gaining confidence that the real systems we use in practice uh, behave the way that, that uh, we want them to, it's critical to do some kind of, some kind of evaluation or verification of, of this uh, software plus human uh, type of system. Um, hopefully also something that you'll come away with it is that uh, um, there are ways of doing this kind of verification uh, of, 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 of uh, systems that involve humans in, I think, reasonably principled ways, even if they don't go, uh, don't, aren't nearly as precise as, as uh, where we would like to be. So I will talk about um, 
uh, verifying a particular kind of system, namely uh, systems where uh, humans, humans create passwords for the purpose of, of authenticating themselves and the kinds of attacks we're going to be worried about is attacks where, where the bad guys try to, uh, try to steal, steal users' passwords or crack their passwords, break into their accounts in some way. Um, why, are, why are passwords interesting? Um, uh, Google and your favorite, whichever your favorite other company is, is trying to convince us that uh, you know, passwords are, are so last century and we'll have great new alternatives to get rid of them soon. And, and I agree, they are last century and, and uh, uh, I'm all in favor of, uh, of ways to get, uh, get rid of passwords. But there are many reasons to believe that we won't get rid of them anytime soon. And so while we don't quite succeed in getting rid of them, uh, we, we might as well figure out how to make them work as well as possible. Now there are lots of, lots of attacks on passwords, including shoulder surfing attacks, online attacks, uh, offline attacks. I'll talk a little bit about offline attacks. Uh, offline attacks are, are scarily common. So hundreds of millions of, of passwords are stolen, uh, are stolen annually in offline attacks. What happens in these attacks is that uh, usually through maybe something like an SQL injection attack, uh, a password database is, is breached and stolen. So the, the attackers wind up with a, with a stolen set of passwords. Now these passwords aren't in plain text. They are uh, usually, uh, usually kept on a database in hashed form. So the attackers can't just go ahead and use these passwords. But what they can do now that they have this, this uh, list of, of password hashes is they can go try to crack these hashes. And what this means is that they run some sort of guessing algorithm which uh, enumerates what, they, what the attacker thinks are likely passwords. Each of these guesses is hashed compared to what's in the, in the stolen password database. And if there's a match, then the attackers know that uh, they have uh, successfully cracked a particular password. Now, the, the easier uh, passwords are to guess, uh, the, the greater the advantage for the attacker. Now, this is true for offline attacks, but it's also true in different kinds of attacks, like online attacks, where no, there's no, no theft of a password database. It's just that the attacker tries to log in as you to your Facebook account or whichever, uh, whichever other account. Uh, now, for, for things like online attacks, um, one tool that's often used is, is rate limiting, that is allowing only a small number of incorrect guesses before you get locked out. But realistically, for many accounts where we log in every day or multiple times, uh, multiple times per day, it's not hard for an attacker to you know, guess every couple of hours and in and, and such, uh, such a way avoid ra rate limiting because every couple of hours the legitimate user will log in, uh, will log in successfully. Okay, so in this, in this space of passwords, what we'd like to do is make passwords, figure out how to make passwords harder to guess without making them particularly painful for, for users to use. And the kinds of, kinds of tools or approaches one might, might, one might uh, bring to bear in this problem are setting password composition policies, that is password requirements of, of particular kinds, maybe uh, make, uh, make people create passwords in the presence of meters that tell them whether the password is good or bad, maybe, uh, maybe invest in user education to explain to users how to pick good passwords or how important it is to, to pick a good password. Uh, but also in this space and in many other spaces when it comes to building these, these uh, systems which, which uh, involve influencing the behavior and sort of more to, to the main point, um, we were able to compare sort of the best configuration that we could come up with of, of all of these different approaches. Um, the, 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 the professionals, the, they, they are represented, they're called pros, they're represented by this, uh, by this black line. Um, kind of what you see is that um, it, it's a little bit of a mixed picture in the sense that, in the sense that the, sometimes the uh, various password cracking algorithms like John the Ripper and Hashcat, sometimes, sometimes they do slightly better than pros, sometimes they do slightly worse than pros. Uh, the probabilistic context-free grammars are pretty good, but maybe not, not at the beginning. At the beginning of the curve, the pros are better. But if we take the, the, the sum of what all these uh, tools uh, that we have at our disposal do, and so we basically construct a curve uh, which is composed of the, of the minimum guesses, of the, of the best guesses of all the, uh, all the tools that we have at our disposal, then we have a conservative approximation for what, what the, the real uh, attackers do or what, what the professional crackers do in the sense that, in the sense that we can, uh, our, 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 uh, the sum is, all, is pretty much always um, 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 shows that we can crack slightly more passwords than, than the attackers actually crack. Yeah, yeah, same passwords. We 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 went with <clears throat> four four different types, of, four different sets of passwords that uh, were sort of representative of different kinds of passwords, and we cracked all of them. We paid them to crack all of them, uh, and this is just picking on one particular set. But the results are reasonably consistent. But not only that, the same password, the same. So you have a certain percentage that you can guess the same password. 
Uh, that, that's a very good question. Did, did we guess exactly the same passwords that they, and they guessed? And, and no, there, the answer is there, well, there, there's a, there's a lot of divergence between the different tools. So for example, PCFG and Hashcat might, might guess pretty different, or PCF, yeah, PCFG and Hashcat might guess pr pretty different passwords. Once you add up all the guesses that, that the, the, our tools have made, I don't think there's much that the professionals have guessed that our tools have not. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, okay, so what did we learn from this, uh, from this experiment? We learned that, well, using these guessing algorithms effectively is really hard, but that we actually can model an attacker, as long as these professional crackers are our reasonable approximation of what, what an attacker in, real, in the real world can do, then we, we actually can model this kind of attacker reasonably well. Um, uh, and, and also, if somebody's doing research on passwords, we now have a, a public password guessability service where you can send us a list of passwords and we'll tell you how hard it is to, to guess them using various algorithms. Um, but so the takeaway here is we were trying to figure out, can we model an external attacker? And we kind of decided that, that yeah, yes, uh, yes, pretty much we can. So then the question is, can we, can we model the system? Namely, can, can we model uh, what kind of passwords people will create uh, if we say, okay, this is the password policy uh, that, that you'll be using? And normally, when people do this kind of research, they, uh, the, the, way that, the, the way they try to validate uh, the choice to use a particular password policy um, involves using one of, these, uh, one of these types of data. People might look at a, a plain text passwords. So, so passwords, password sets that have been uh, leaked where the entire password set is leaked because whoever uh, owned the password set didn't bother to hash the passwords when they were storing them. Or people use these, uh, these password sets that were, were correctly hashed and then you don't see all of the passwords, you only see the subsets that was cracked. Or you might collect passwords in online studies where you, you uh, simulate the experience or, or cause the user to create an account, come back a couple of days later, uh, log in, into that account, and you, know, you don't tell them the studies about, about passwords, but in, uh, you're, you're, you're forcing them to, to create a particular kind of password or, or in a particular setting. Or maybe uh, you, you call people into the lab. That, that, um, all of those are, are methods that people use. Uh, each of the methods has some disadvantages. Either you get not very much data or the data experiment is experimental rather than real or it's self-reported. Uh, but the leaked the, the leak data is always of questionable uh, quality or since, since, since it's hard to be sure w uh, where it's from or that it's complete and so on. Uh, in the user studies, you're protecting uh, minimal value accounts. Um, so it's unclear when, you're, when this is how you do passwords research whether your results are, are generalizable. So. We, we, we went and tried to figure out which of these methods is a reasonable proxy for actual, uh, actual field studies where you get people to create passwords on, on, on real systems. Um, how did we do this? Well, uh, we have lots of friends at CMU, unsurprisingly. Uh, but perhaps, perhaps surprisingly, the operations people at CMU are, are really, really helpful. Uh, and so through the operations people at CMU, we indirectly got access to all the plain text passwords at CMU. Uh, including contextual data for those passwords, which involved logs and demographics. Uh, we even uh, fed, uh, we were able to, to instrument the password change process with a pointer to a survey uh, that, that, that we carried out. Did all the users give you permission? Uh, on the next slide. Uh, so, um, so, so with this, we, we sought to answer two questions. One is, can, can, is there some approximation of field data that works reasonably well? Uh, and the second one is, uh, uh, you know, since we have lots of cool data, let's just mine it and see what, what comes out. Um, yes, so the huge issue, and I know there are some department heads and deans in the room that might be, uh, might be concerned about this. So, so yes, we, you know, we did ask for approval for our study uh, uh, and, 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 and received it. And in fact, uh, we didn't actually touch any passwords. The way this worked is our information security uh, office did all the work on our behalf. Well, did a lot of work on our behalf. We wound up buying two machines. One of the machines was under lock and key, not connected to the network, completely set up by the information security office. Uh, and then that machine saw passwords, uh, uh, which, which our code analyzed. And then we got, got some printouts, which were personally approved by the director of the information security office to make sure that there was nothing, nothing sketchy in there. Um, yeah, this was, this, this was lots of fun and involved, lots of, involved some, some panicked phone calls by by the, the, the information uh, security office people when they realized that you know, none of the passwords or m many of the database, their databases were not of a shape that they said they were in. And so of course, none of our scripts for parsing the databases worked. Uh, and then we would, we would in a panic try to recreate the problem and, and solve it for them and tell them over the, over, the, over the phone how to modify the code to make it work. Um, and, and, and from that we got, yes. 
Yes. Ah, yes. This is a, this is an interesting. This a, that's an excellent question. So so it turns out so so no, nobody nobody when we started this uh, these conversations with them nobody believed that that they would have the plain text passwords and we were talking about how could we instrument the password logon process to gain access to the plain text uh, you know while they were live, and then somebody somebody in the room after you know several hours of meeting said why don't we just give you the plain text passwords, and then there was silence uh, for for about a minute. Um, <laughs> So it, it, it turns out that most uh, password management systems keep passwords reversibly, uh, reversibly encrypted. And the reason they do this is that password management systems are used in scenarios where they might need to interface with some legacy system that was written 30 years ago and requires your passwords to be supplied in plain text. And so to enable interoperation with such systems, passwords are, are kept reversibly, uh, reversibly encrypted. Uh, CMU, CMU, uh, after, after, after this became clear to everybody, CMU dropped that system on the floor and now doesn't, doesn't keep <laughs> passwords reversibly encrypted anymore. Yes? Two questions. Did you run this through NetXMA? Yes, yes, yes. The second question is how do we reproduce your results since we don't have a Yes, <laughs> yes. We, we, we did and you can't. Uh, yes. Um, uh, happy to talk about it more later. Um, yeah, so we had lots of fun, fun, well, lots of fun with the data. One of the pieces of fun with the data we had is, is we we analyzed the passwords uh, of, of of people created. Uh, sorry, we, we analyzed the password separately. The passwords that that uh, were created by people in different uh, different colleges, right? Where colleges are things like for us like humanities and engineering and computer science and art. Uh, so there's there was a big difference in in you know the college that created the strongest password and the college that created the weakest password. So what's, what's, what's your guess as to what's the strongest or weakest? What's weakest? CS. Weakest is CS. No, okay. A second guess for weakest? Administration. Administration. No, so <laughs> that's, that's interesting. One, so th these are actually, they, they, these, each line combines uh, students, staff, uh, uh, and faculty. So we, we surprisingly saw very little difference between uh, students, uh, staff, and faculty. Um, turns out business is really terrible, and computer science is good. Uh, art is way better than business, which is a little bit weird. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in, well, I'm, I'm both in computer science and engineering, so I guess it, I don't, can't feel too bad. Uh, but humanities are surprisingly good. Um, anyway, so, so what we really wanted to do is we'll want to figure out how similar are these CMU passwords to passwords that people would create if we get them, if, if, if we, if we um, uh, don't, have, don't have real data? So if we look at online studies or lab studies or whatever. Uh, and I, I won't go into the details, but there was cracking involved and comparing along many dimensions. And uh, the conclusion was that well-designed online studies where people uh, are, uh, we get people to create accounts and passwords do a pretty good job at approximating uh, the, the, the kind of passwords that, that uh, that you would get in a, in a real system. So now, now, the, now we kind of think that we, we can model a system in the sense that even without deploying a system, we can run this kind of small online study and, and get some pretty good data. And that data also includes information about how long it takes to type in a password or how many attempts to it takes to create it and other, various other metrics of usability. And then we can, now we have sort of a, a, a methodology for constructing a system model, a methodology for modeling an attacker, and now we can start actually doing doing work by, by examining password composition policies and so on. And I won't, uh, I won't uh, uh, stress Fred out by going through all of that other than we did lots of this examination of password composition policies. They matter, well, uh, long, long length is good, so then we examined them some more. We found particular ones that are all better than the CMU policy, namely pe people, people, people do pretty well with long passwords, uh, better than you'd expect. We looked at password meters. Password meters are great. They make cause people to make strong passwords that are not less usable. Whether a meter has a, has a bar or a Bugs Bunny doesn't matter, they work equally well, but meters should be pretty strict. And people people, people uh, apparently react well to being told that their passwords suck, but not so much that their passwords are, are mediocre. As soon as you tell a person their password is mediocre, a person says, oh great, I'm done. It doesn't need to be any better than that. Okay, I'm thank done. You. Um, thank you. Uh, could you comment on the difference between mass scale attacks and targeted attacks? Yeah, yeah. So this was most of what we did was in the context of uh, of uh, attacks that don't go after an individual, but they might go after after an organization. Uh, um, and so 
what we mostly see if, in these somewhat targeted attacks, um, uh, the, the, the choice of words that might appear in passwords is slightly different. Uh, but we can do a pretty good job at approximating that by just uh, you know, picking um, or, or, or uh, differently weighting words that are related to a particular geographic area, like names of sports teams and so on. For, for very targeted attacks, of course, what real, real guys do is they, they troll for information on individuals and then they seed their training data with so that background knowledge. We yeah. haven't tried that. Yeah. If, if we, so if we mandate your password guessability system or a really good meter and we all have to you know, keep trying until we get a good one, yes. uh, we've actually thrown away a bunch of entropy. If, if the bad guys know this and then get to train their PCFG on, yeah. on that, how much have you tried that? Do you know yeah. how much we've yeah. made so, it worse? So all, of, all, of our, uh, all of our experiments are with the assumption that the attacker knows what the policy is. So, so the, the, the attacker is trained to attack that specific policy. Uh, and, and, and basically what you see is, 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 is that the, what the good policies do is they, they make guessing difficult not just for algorithms trained on old policies, but also they actually spread out the space of passwords even, even independently of that. Yeah. Thank you, speaker again.